Thanks, folks. Okay, so um, our panel this evening is dedicated to questions of culture and ethics in the workplace. And I'm really honored to be joined by, by a truly amazing and impressive group. Uh, you can read full bios of everyone on our Long Game website, longgameconference.com. But I would like to briefly introduce uh, each one of them before we begin. So first is Dr. Kristen Neff, who's an associate professor of educational psychology and my colleague here in UT's College of Education. Uh, Dr. Neff is a pioneer, I, I would say the pioneer in the academic study of self-compassion. She's published dozens of academic articles and book chapters uh, and several books, including Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself, which has been translated into 16 languages by my count. Uh, her latest book, Fear Self-Compassion, will be out this June, and we look forward to that. Uh, next is Dr. Ethan Burris. Uh, he's a professor and department chair of management and the Chevron Centennial Fellow at the Macomb School of Business, also here at UT Austin. He's also the director of the Center for Leadership and Ethics and has served as a visiting scholar at both Microsoft and Google. An award-winning educator and researcher, he studies, teaches, and consults on topics relating to leadership, people analytics, talent insights, managing power in politics, building engagement in groups and teams, social enterprise, and negotiations. Next up is Paxton K. Baker. He's a businessman, entrepreneur, and philanthropist who has served in the entertainment, music, sports, and production industries for over 30 years. He spent 16 years serving as the executive vice president and general manager of Centric, part, part of the BET family of networks, where amongst other things, he was responsible for the revival of Soul Train and the Soul Train Awards. The youngsters in the crowd, get on YouTube, watch some Soul Train. It's well worth your time. Uh, Mr. Baker is a minority owner of the Washington Nationals Baseball Club and currently serves as chairman of the Washington Nationals Founding Partners Group. He's also a partner in the ownership group of the Washington Castles World Tennis World Team Tennis League organization and a governing board member of the Global Sports Summit. And finally, last but not least, we have Jim Rooney, who many of you had a chance to watch uh, as a moderator in one of our earlier sessions. He's also a co-organizer co of this entire event. Uh, Mr. Rooney is a business owner, consultant, facilitator, speaker, and author. He spent decades working alongside his late father, Dan Rooney, not only in their family business, also known as the Pittsburgh Steelers, but also during Dan's time as U.S. Ambassador to Ireland. Jim's book, A Different Way to Win, Dan Rooney's Story from the Super Bowl to the Rooney Rule, was featured on President Obama's list of his favorite books in 2019. And also the, uh, that same book resulted in, in my meeting Jim and our relationship and setting us on the path to co-organizing the symposium and being here today. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. And so this evening, we're talking about culture and ethics in the workplace and in the sports workplace in particular. And these are tricky topics, but when I think of culture and ethics, they strike me as these sort of ideas that uh, we might classify as simple, but not easy. Uh, you know, a pair of concepts that everyone is quick to celebrate, uh, but can be quite meaning or quite challenging to meaningfully actualize in organizational settings. So for the sake of tonight's discussions, we'll keep our definition straightforward. When we talk about ethics, these are, you know, this is the process of identifying the right things to do and then doing those things for the right reasons. Culture we might define as a shared belief system of underlying values. Every organization claims to value ethics and culture, but not all are successful at cultivating healthy cultures and supporting ethical behaviors and practices. I expect our panelists tonight will help shed some light on the challenges of ethics and culture and share ways in which we can better deliver on the promise of these important concepts. And so to begin, um, I'd like to consider the role of the individual in an organization. And, and my first question is for, for Kristen. Um, when we think of ethics and culture, we often jump straight, straight into groups and teams uh, and I think sometimes we're getting ahead of ourselves. We need to remember that these units are comprised of individuals. And so, you know, based on your work, can you briefly define self-compassion and share how developing self-compassion can empower and enable individuals to perform better in their careers and maybe just generally in their lives? Yeah, yes, I'd love to. Um, so self-compassion, the, the definition of self-compassion is really no different than the definition of compassion in general. It's just it's aimed inward as well as outward. So what is compassion? Um, you know, compassion is concern with the alleviation of suffering, 
right? It's an open-hearted stance that we give to others and hopefully ourselves in terms of how do we cope with the tough stuff, right? Whether it's really tough stuff like racial injustice or if it's ind individual tough stuff, like I just failed and, you know, lost the, team, the game for my team, right? Which is also very tough, but more at the individual level. And so really self-compassion is a way of, of coping. It's a type of inner strength that allows us to cope with suffering, to cope with difficult emotions, with feelings of inadequacy, with um, challenges in a way that's healthy and productive. Um, and so unlike self-esteem, it seems it might seem similar, self-compassion and self-esteem. Self-esteem is wanting to judge oneself positively, and it usually comes from feeling better than others, superior to others. And of course, in athletics, a lot of, a lot of self-esteem is invested in, in winning games and being the best. Uh, the motivation of self-compassion isn't it about being better than others. It's simply um, caring for yourself and reaching your, your ultimate um, potential. Um, and uh, the research shows that self-compassion is actually a much better motivator because instead of, you know, when you fail, self-esteem deserts you. Or, and if you criticize yourself thinking that's gonna help you do better next time, what the research shows is it just actually makes you do worse because you get anxious and you, know, you lose faith in yourself. So self-compassion, you might say, is a constructive, encouraging, effective, um, and also open-hearted and connected way of relating to your own difficulties. And the research is really starting to show that it's very beneficial for athletes. And so my personal belief is, you know, self-compassion and compassion for each other should really be part, one of the core values of, of um, the athletic world. That's great, thank you. Um, and, you know, a lot of our attendees are, are students looking to, you know, enter and start their careers, but I also know we've got some, some folks who've got some experience. And I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, are there different facets of self-compassion that can help us succeed and be our best selves, you know, early in our careers, early in our lives versus later on when we take on more leadership type roles? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the earlier you develop the, the, the habit of self-compassion, the better. And so, you know, the real beauty of self-compassion is it actually is, is what allows you to learn from failure. Instead of saying, what does that say about me? Does, you know, does that mean I'm a bad person or I'm inadequate or, you know, any judgments? It's like, okay, I failed. Well, all human beings fail. How can I learn and grow from this? So if that starts to be the approach to failure, that failure is actually a learning opportunity as opposed to a damnation of self-worth, you know, for yourself, then when you come to more leadership roles, that that ethic is brought into an organization. And by the way, it doesn't mean that we don't, we like to fail, we like to win, <laughs> but how do we get from the failure to the win, right? And so if this is the ethic that, okay, no one's gonna be shamed for failing because shame doesn't help anyone, Everyone's going to be encouraged and helped to do their best with the understanding that, you know, again, we're all in this together and we all care about each other. And we want to support each other. And I think that ethic in an organization um, can be really helpful, both internally and externally. That's great. Thank you, uh, Jim. We're going to turn to you now. And, and I know, you know, I'm, I'm sharing the secrets, but I know you're personally a fan of, of Kristen's work. And, you know, I think we don't immediately think of self-compassion or even compassion in the bruising world of, of the NFL and other you know, high-profile pro sports. So how do you see work like Kristen's translating into sports both on and off the field? Well, and, and it's great to be here. And I, I'm, I'm a fan of all the panelists' uh, work, and, but, but I, I've really you know, been, been following up on Kristen's work recently. And you know, I think there's a lot of stories that, that I saw with my dad being successful in professional sports that that deal with compassion now not necessarily self-compassion but if you take the the, the definition and, and broaden it to compassion towards others i think one great example is uh coach bill cower who just got in the hall of fame this year we had three losing seasons uh talking about learning from losses between 1997 and 2000 and everyone in pittsburgh you know all the all the talk radio shows etc wanted us to fire bill cower and my father you know, he didn't say it's okay to lose, but he didn't get on his back. He, he, if you will, stood shoulder to shoulder with him for those seasons. And, and we looked at, you know, the injuries, the development rates of different players, you know, and understanding that, that, you know, Bill was, was a, we, we hired him, I think at age 34. So he was still relatively young 
in his own development process. He had, he had a lot of successes in his first three, three to five seasons as a coach. I, I think we made the playoffs every year. And then you had this downswing. And then, you know, Bill goes on 2001. We win, we go to the AFC championship game in 2005. We, we win the Super Bowl. And, and had my father not sort of had that sense of, of compassion, of understanding how I understand Kristen's work, and she correct me if I'm wrong, but that it is a developmental tool that Bill Cowher doesn't go to the Hall of Fame. And I'm not sure the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, have this successful run in the early 2000s um, that he had. And, and I think Bill then took that to his approach to his coaches. I, I think folks talk about him becoming a better coach to his assistant coaches throughout the, the early 2000s. And we had a better team. And I think he had a sense of, of developing players better. So, so from that model, I really saw, or from that example, I really saw a sense of compassion proliferate and develop, you know, really effective success in a very competitive environment throughout the organization. Thanks, Jimmy. I, I love that. And I think, you know, to the, to the general public, Coach Cower, you know, wouldn't be the first person you think of when you think of self-compassion. I mean, he's known for being just a tough kind of classic coach. Uh, so I think that's a really insightful story. Um, staying on the individual level and turning to uh, to Paxton now. Um, so in your career, you've you know you've ascended to several really prominent leadership positions over the years. And I'm just wondering, looking back, you know what qualities or behaviors, practices uh, do you believe put you in a position to get these roles and then to succeed in them? And are there any of these things that you wish you had developed earlier in your career? Well, great question. And uh, let me begin, begin by saying thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me on the panel. And I also want to give a nod to uh, my good friend, Jim Rooney, for being kind enough to invite me on it. Uh, Jim is a beautiful human being and one of those people in life when he calls you and asks you to do something, answers, yes, let me figure out and make the time to be able to, to, uh, to put it together. So uh, honored to be with everybody this afternoon. Uh, I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. I'm right across the stadium, right across the street from the National Stadium, and also Audi Field, which tonight we're hosting uh, the first opening game for the, uh, the D.C. Spirit from the National Women's Soccer League Club. Uh, multiple blessings throughout the course of my life, and would begin with my mother, who taught me compassion. And uh, we were, um, I was raised an Orthodox Seventh-day Adventist. And which was an odd thing. I was born in Compton, California in 1960. So it was kind of an odd duck in the environment uh, that I lived in. Uh, but compassion was a, uh, a daily part of my household and something I, I, I learned from my mother. And, um, and then when I was 17 years old, I was given a gift uh, by a gentleman who, who thought I had a lot of promise. And uh, he gave me a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And uh, that book changed my life and put me on a, a trajectory that it took me years to kind of sort through and fully understand the gist of all the book. But one of the first things I got from it, which is kind of the uh, 12 principles of riches that Napoleon Hill wrote about, uh, was a positive mental attitude and uh, developing your mental attitude and forming it and making it become so strong that you pretty much can go through almost any circumstance that life seems to throw at you. And um, I learned that positive mental attitude as a young person. Uh, the second principle was sound physical health and the importance of health in your life. And then it went on to everything from harmony, human relationships, uh, building friendships, the capacity for faith, a wider array of principles that he spoke about. But the mental attitude was something that I latched onto. And um, I developed uh, that is, uh, when asked, how am I doing? I repeat the affirmation, healthy and positive, uh, over and over and over. And that, uh, so regardless of what my state is, that's what I convince myself. And that's what I, I put into myself on a regular basis. One of the other things that my mother taught me at a young age that has carried throughout the whole of my career has been volunteerism and the importance of that. Uh, the Bible talks about tithing. And uh, for me, volunteerism was, was almost kind of a different version of that, of convincing yourself that you had enough within yourself that you could share with others. And um, that's one of the principles of wealth and one of the principles of, of, of riches is being able to share your blessings with other people. That's been something else that's been kind of with me. And in volunteerism and all of the work environments that I've been in, uh, 
uh, being able to volunteer to do more than what I got paid to do to more than what was expected of me have been kind of the tenets and the core of, of my career. Uh, as I've grown through a young professional, uh, had my own company at probably in my late 20s, uh, producing award shows in different countries throughout the world. Uh, every place I went to, I always wanted to do more than I got paid to do as a professional, uh, to give more, to share more, to bring other people up with me. Uh, that has been another one of the tenets of my career has been bringing other people up with me uh, and leading by example. Uh, when we do productions, when I ran the TV channel from my end, everything from something as fundamental as when you go into a bathroom and picking up paper and uh, everybody shares that bathroom together and I want to make sure that it's, it's clean when I leave it. Uh, whatever it happens to be on big stages around the world, big major award shows that I've done, always uh, being mindful of my environment, being mindful of, of what my tonality, what my vibration was myself uh, by way of being positive at any and every given time and in a leadership role, but also kind of um, learning stories from the Bible, but also Dr. King, who was one of the great uh, influences on my life and um, what he calls servant leadership. Not being too proud to do any job that happens to come to you, the less glamorous ones, whatever else that happens to be. So those are principles as well that I've kept in the leadership of, of um, in, in my life and in leadership positions that I've held. So I'll boil it back to mental attitude, which I think is the most important thing that you live with on a daily basis. I'm a big believer in affirmations. I do affirmations every morning when I wake up. I do additional affirmations when I go to sleep at night. Um, my competition is, is always only with myself and with my colleagues I work to uh, open doors for myself and certainly open doors for other people and have them come along with me. And volunteerism has certainly been a key component of that and then sharing my blessings with other people. That's great, thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a lot to think about for us there. That's, that's really nice. Um, and I know if you read Kristen's work, there's some affirmations in there too. So we, we've got overlaps. Um, Ethan, turning to you um, and, and kind of building, you know, like we did on, on Kristen's research, um, some of your work, is in the area of uh, what's called employee voice. And I was wondering, you know, if, if, you know, like Kristen did, if you can kind of briefly explain this idea of employee voice and its implications for leadership and management. And again, you know, do we think about employee voice differently as we start our careers versus as we move into more leadership and, and more powerful positions in organizations? Thanks, Tolga. Um, so first of all, I'm really thankful and, and, and happy to be here. I'm um, also thankful for the opportunity to follow Paxton. Um, that was kind of an amazing opening. So thanks very much for slotting me right behind him. That's, uh, that's fantastic there. Um, I'm, I'm real excited to uh, be able to spend some time today and, and share a little bit about some of my research and, and certainly how it connects with the other panelists too. Uh, so as you mentioned, I, I study a concept that I call employee voice. And in the context of most corporations, that is, what leads employees to speak up? And that is have honest and candid conversations with your boss about the way things are, about problems that you see, and then how those leaders and managers respond to that feedback, which is not always a, a positive thing. And so uh, I work with uh, individual employees on how they can better socialize their ideas. So what are tactics, what are ways that you can get your ideas across to increase the chance that you'll be successful. Just as a very quick example, um, and connecting back to the, the last set of panelists, um, there's a lot of talk and, and certainly a lot of focus over these last um, 12 to 18 months on, on social justice. And we've seen a range of tactics that players and other members of uh, sporting organizations have, have taken to speak up about these types of issues. We have NFL players kneeling on the field. We have NBA basketball players and um, their actions over the course of last summer and um, to, to bring some of those social justice issues to light. We see Major League Baseball and what they've done in pulling out of the All-Star game. And all of these are different tactics to start to bring that up as an issue in order to initiate change. And so one set of questions we start to examine is, well, what are some of those tactics and how successful are they? And much at the same time, I, I, a, a huge portion of that equation is how managers respond. What is the psychology that enables them to kind of dig in their heels in some cases 
and in other cases be quite excited about devoting resources and efforts to make some changes in those organizations. And so as, as we start to talk here about the, you know, kind of the nature of um, both individuals and speaking up about not only ethics, but other cultural problems or just how to get work done in most organizations. To me, these, this goes to some of the fundamental questions about how individuals speak the truth to power and how those people in those powerful positions respond to sometimes quite critical feedback in order to make positive change. That's great, thank you. Yeah, and, and I think that that kind of gives us a, a nice segue into trying to tackle this question of culture head on, uh, because I, I don't think I'm oversimplifying your research to say that healthy cultures have good support for employee voice and having important conversations. Um, and so we'll go back to, to Paxton uh, first here. As I mentioned in my introduction, you know, organizational culture is easy to define, but hard to develop. And in your experience working in, in sports and entertainment and beyond, I was just wondering what you believe are the key factors um, in a healthy and productive workplace culture and how do you foster those things? Um, and maybe any insights on the sports world versus the non-sports world that you've, that you've experienced. So uh, thank you on that one as well. Uh, you, you picked some good questions for me. So thank you for that one, thank for you. sure. Uh, I, for, for me, I, I come back to mental attitude, and uh, that is the core for me with any group of people that, that I, I find myself in, both uh, from the sports space. Uh, I've been a part of uh, the Lerner family with the Washington Nationals Baseball Club now for 16 years, and uh, uh, the Learners are one of the larger real estate development companies in the metropolitan Washington, uh, uh, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. It's referred to as the DMV around here. And they have uh, about 40 major buildings, uh, malls, properties, town centers uh, littered throughout the whole of the area here. And um, when I first met them, uh, the first night that I had my very first conversation to join their group, and just by way of just a little history, uh, the Major League Baseball took over the Montreal Expos in 2003, 2004, and they shopped it to a number of different cities across the United States. They shopped it to Jacksonville, Sacramento, Portland, Las Vegas, uh, Northern Virginia, and Washington, D.C., and they, the uh, D.C. City Council uh, basically said they would put up a $650 million bond, but they wanted whatever group that got the uh, ownership to have uh, significant minority participation. So I was fortunate in that regard, and Commissioner Steelig uh, took to it very, very warmly. And uh, uh, there were 13 groups in the beginning, and it was kind of a beauty contest. And one of the things that Commissioner had told everybody was, "Don't politic. Do not get out publicly in politic. You, it, we're, we're going to judge it based on the group and our research and the, the individuals involved there." So it was a little bit of pressure by way of uh, being a part of the group. But the Lerner family had been. Uh, since the 1950s had been in the property business and built a really solid reputation. Uh, each of the people that they uh, brought along with them were kind of uh, very finely picked and uh, good background research done on each person that was coming into it. The original partner was James Brown, who's on uh, CBS Sports uh, football analyst, and then myself. And um, each of us, it was like, it was kind of a unique grouping of people. And so I was really proud that the body of work that I had uh, built for myself over the years in the uh, music production space, in the media TV space, uh, was kind of really, it spoke for itself. And so the first meeting I had with the Learner family was supposed to have been a one hour meeting and it lasted almost three hours. And when I walked out of that meeting that day, I felt very confident that if the Learner family was fortunate enough to get the team, that I would certainly be a part of their group. So I think that there's a certain amount of uh, self-confidence that you have to have. And I would like to think that the self-confidence is built on successes and meaningful things that you've done with your career and meaningful things that you've done with your time. Clearly each of us has limited time uh, on this earth. And so uh, for me, the fundamentals of kind of really building yourself up to be a positive individual. Uh, there's um, you know, the saying, uh, let your light uh, so shine before men that they uh, you know, see your good work and glorify your father. So uh, for me, that's been something that I kind of grew up with by way of like really pushing myself to be the best person that I possibly could be. I think that that type of leadership is infectious. And I think that 
uh, leaders who are willing to go the extra mile, leaders that are compassionate themselves, leaders that are willing to share their blessings with other people who, are, who, who truly care about the other people around them, that type of leadership actually, it, 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 it uh, becomes magnetic and it attracts other people to it. And I think that uh, in any organization that that type of leadership, if it starts at the top, that it can carry through and view to the whole of the organization. Uh, I try to be that person on a daily basis by way of um, thinking about others, by way of sharing, by way of listening to other people. Uh, I try to be the type of leader that uh, somebody doesn't necessarily have to ask me for things that through listening to uh, different things in conversation that I can be uh, in tune enough to other people to do some of those things without people actually asking me to do so. I've been fortunate um, with the baseball team, with the Learner family to have that same type of uh, organizational culture. Uh, with the, uh, we won the 2019 World Series. We took over the team in 2006. And uh, by 2012, we made the, uh, we were the Eastern Division uh, champions in the National League. Uh, we, were, we were there in 13 and 14. And then we won again in 16 and 17. And each year we were eliminated in the first round of the playoffs and were truly heartbroken. Uh, the year that we won it, actually, we won it as the wild card team. And uh, we, had, we had to go through a number of hurdles along the way. Uh, the final rung, of course, was uh, we were the first team ever. The, the World Series that we won in 2019 uh, was the first time that the visiting teams had won every game on the road. It had never been done actually in hockey, basketball, or baseball, or football. I'm sorry, not football, basketball, baseball, or hockey had never done that. So uh, we were tested. Uh, when we went on our run, we were uh, 12 games below. We were 19 to 31. And when we went on our run to, to win the series and uh, that compassion was tested every, every, every point along the way by way of believing in each other. When we fell as an organization, not blaming people, uh, it was beautiful to see the players come together. And most people did not think that we could have done it the year that we won or that we lost our superstar, Bryce Harper, who went over to the Phillies, uh, arguably one of the best players of, of the day. We lost that player and then we went on to win. Uh, and I think that part of it was because because everybody galvanized around it as a team. And we truly learned what it was to be a team. And that's a big part of what, what drove us. I'm sure that Jim could give a number of stories with the Steelers on uh, every year in baseball or any, any professional sports, you lose people, you gain people, you have different things that happen. But it's a rare time when you lose the big, biggest superstar, uh, one of the biggest superstars of, of certainly of our franchise and, and in, the, in the whole game. That was the year that we, we really melded together. And I think that that, uh, that trust, that compassion, that belief, uh, those, uh, that, that level of respect, all of those things were there that helped us fuel us as an organization. So for me as a, as a leader, it's incumbent upon me to be the best person that I could be and then try to share that with others uh, with, throughout the organization. And I've been fortunate enough to be a part of leadership groups um, with myself included that have been able to inspire that level of passion uh, in other people. Uh, th thank you. And, 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 and you set Jim up well, and, and Jim, I am going to go to you. And I, and I think that leading by example um, was a hallmark of your, your late fathers. And, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, professional sports, especially where the talent across teams is almost the same, you know, there's, there's so, there aren't big gaps, generally speaking, but it seems that some teams just seem to win a little bit more than others. And the Steelers have been one of those. And it seems to a certain extent that culture is the, so to speak, secret sauce. And so I'm just wondering if, you know, like Paxton before you, some examples or ideas from within the Steelers world or others you've observed that how do we make a healthy culture? So, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said on, on, I guess we could all talk about all these issues for a long time, but um, you know, so, so the Steelers, I can give, all types of examples of, of what we've done in terms of my father would have used the word integration. Now we use the word diversity, but that, that, that sense of belonging became so important as an underlying component of our culture and how that attributed to winning. But, you know, it's, it's roots come from, my father was really inspired by Martin Luther King and, and, you know, he took over the, the team during that day. And so he writes in the business plan, I want the Steelers to be one of the most highly integrated team. But to, to get to Ethan's point, you know, he, he didn't do as good a job after he put that in the business plan for, for a couple of years. And, and a gentleman named Bill Nunn 
uh, was, was a writer for one of the most highly circulated African-American newspapers in the country. And he says, you know, Dan Rooney says this stuff, but he doesn't do it. And so my father, through, a, through a, a number of meetings with Bill, sat down and said, look, I do want to do this. And so he was willing to be criticized and to hear from a point of view and an experience that he, he desired but didn't have. And so ultimately, we hired Bill Nunn. Bill Nunn just got elected to the NFL Hall of Fame. We draft more players from the HBCUs than any other team from 1968 to 1980. You have, you, you have this more diverse team because we were willing to, to, to do, you know, do things differently. But it also had this impact that, yes, my father was the leader of the culture, but the culture also was emergent from, from the bottom up. And, and there, was, there was direction from leadership, but there also was this sense of participation. One other quick story, and again, you know, these are these are all Dan Rooney stories, but that's what I wrote the book on. So, the, so the, the easiest things I can access that I think really demonstrated a sense of trust to the players who came from, you know, the black schools and didn't have the same, well, hadn't had the same experience. I guess coming in was 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 this going to be fair? And and you know, it's sort of a, an interesting example because because both these guys would say it was a negative experience. Um, that ultimately got resolved, but, but we, had, we had major contract negotiations and both of them held out. One was a, was a great white player Hall of Famer named Jack Lambert, and the other was a great uh, black player Hall of Famer who came from uh, one of the HBCUs, Mel Blunt. And the fact that you know, we didn't just give Jack, the white guy, the contract that, that, that both went through these sort of prolonged negotiations you know, on one hand, I think my father looked like the bad guy because he was being such a tough negotiator. But, but talking to so many of these guys who came from that experience, they said that really meant something, that we saw that, that he was negotiating with everyone from a tough standpoint. And ultimately, we, we, we came to, to conclusions and signed these guys to, to really good contracts, but, but that there was that sense of, of equality, not just, not just sort of the, the commitment with Bill Nunn and bringing folks in, but in the business dealings, um, I think created a layer of trust at, at, at a really important point. And, and that, that, you know, doing what you say, being authentic, following through or critical, and then executing with, with business practices. Uh, I think those are two things that I saw that were really effective within, within our culture that, that, changed, that, that made it unique. Great, thank you. Um, Ethan, kind of b building on that, um... I'm not going to make you go through all of the organizational culture uh, research because there's you know no shortage of that, um, but just maybe you know from from your work and, and your familiarity with this, what are some of you know the the, the research supported best practices uh, for building culture? And I know you've you've worked and looked at both you know traditional you know corporate organizations, but also at the sports world. And is there anything that the business world does right that sports should learn from and vice versa? What do sports get right that that business might be able to, to learn from? Sure. Um, so you, you have a, a lot of questions there. Um, yeah. So first, I, I, I guess I want to touch back on, you know, what, what is culture and, and how can you, especially as leaders, start to, you know, pull some strings and push uh, some knobs in order to affect that culture in some way? So the culture, as you mentioned at the very beginning, is nothing more than a shared set of beliefs or values. And, and the issue with that is it's hard to really kind of put your fingers on exactly what those values are. You can't see them unless they behaviorally manifest in some way. So if you're going to start to try and change these values within a large organization, you have to think about how to change what someone else holds dear about the place where they work. And that's, that's an incredibly hard thing to do. You can't just go to someone and say, you should value execution um, of our tasks much more than you, than you currently are. Or you should value diversity much more than you currently do. Like it's, it's hard to just say that without actually seeing it. So the way leaders typically do this, typically they manage this is through a lot of systems things like hiring practices. Who do you bring into the organization? What are their attributes? What, what do they say that they care about? As you bring them in, what management scholars call are the socialization practices. 
the trainings, the stories that we tell about what is valuable here, the ceremonies, the um, legendary stories about what's unique to this organization that is so different from, from the others. What are the reward structures, the recognitions for certain people who display those behaviors? So as Jim was talking about his father and, and, and making changes inside the organization for what it would value around diversity, by his practices for the contracts that he was negotiating with players, those are visible signals about what the organization now values. And every employee starts to, to then see that. So to me, it's important to talk about those three sets of tactics that you really, that most leaders have at their disposal through, through the system. That, that's why leadership has such a strong imprinting on the culture. They control who comes in, they talk about the stories and the things that are important to the organization, and they recognize and reward certain people for displaying those sets of behaviors. So, you know, then you start to ask, well, what, what can the sports world learn from the business world and vice versa? Well, to me, this is where there's a lot of interesting research that goes on in both fields. So, um, in, in, the, in the field of sports, going back since the days of Moneyball and Sabermetrics, there's such a strong presence there of using data to make informed decisions about what compensation policy should be for individual players and how long you should keep a particular team together versus letting some players go. Well, in the business world, it's a lot harder for a Goldman Sachs as an organization to measure the performance of every single analyst compared to hits on the baseball field in the realm of sports. But we can use the same type of metrics approach to understand who's valuable and to recognize kind of the merits that um, that, that value brings. So that's kind of going from the sports world to the business world. Vice versa, uh, we have some fantastic research on things like CEO succession. So those are, those are decisions about hiring, about who to promote to the highest levels of the organization. And what are those attributes about those individuals that are gonna positively shape the organization over the coming years. Well, there's a load of history of research on not only those attributes of CEOs, but how those attributes match the specific context of those organizations. Is this an organization that is um, a beacon of stability or does it need to change a whole lot? Well, as you start to tra you know, traverse back to the sports world, are you replacing a coach that decides to retire at the pinnacle of success right after a Super Bowl? Or are you replacing a coach where the, that team has underperformed for a variety of reasons and there needs to be massive change? Well, that should dictate the type of new coach that you end up hiring. So we can start to take some lessons learned from the realm of CEO successions and then start to look how that would apply very specifically in, in the head coaching situation. That's great, thank you. Uh, Kristen, kind of bringing us home on, on culture here. And, you know, I know we, we maybe get hung up on that word self and compassion, but like you said, there's just, it's part of a more general compassion. And I'm just wondering if, if you can share your insights on, you know, how does compassion foster culture and how can we build cultures of compassion, which I think would be really productive and healthy for everyone. Up, oh, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, thank you. Um, and, and you know, thank you, Ethan, so much because I'm, I'm gonna drop into a very radically different level than the level you're talking about, which is really important to culture and values. Um, and I'm actually gonna go back to what Paxton said about how mindset is so important. And that actually is, is true literally because the way the human brain is designed is that our internal emotional and mental attitude impacts others' internal emotional and mental attitude. So the human brain was designed to um, survive in cooperative groups. Charles Darwin actually only said um, survival of the fittest once in the entire origin of species. He instead repeatedly said survival of the most cooperative. Those groups who learned to cooperate survived. And so the human brain is designed, a big portion of the real estate of the human brain is designed to pick up at a pre-verbal level 
of what other people are feeling. We actually have specialized mirror neurons whose whole function it is to feel what other people are feeling, right? And again, pre-verbally. So, because parents, you know, when they raise their kids, the kid can't speak. So those parents who are able to pick up on what their kids were feeling were able to pass on their DNA. So basically, quite literally, you know, if, if maybe, we're, maybe we're professional and we aren't like yelling at people and we're being kind of okay on the outside, but if inside we're full of shame and self-criticism and anger and frustration or self-doubt or fear, other people are actually picking up on that through their own mirror neurons at a pre-verbal level. Whereas if we're filled full of kindness, encouragement, you know, understanding, you know, maybe some tough love, it doesn't mean like we're weak or wimpy, you know, I mean, we're strong, we're standing up for our rights, for, our, for being treated fairly, but what we cultivate inside actually impacts other people. So in some ways, the idea of the individual and the group is kind of a, it's a conceptual idea, but at the, at the level of reality, it actually doesn't work that way, right? Where, where people interacting and, you know, we're influencing each other all the time. So if we want to change our culture, if we want our culture to be more compassionate, maybe um, more, more just, more fair, um, to be more effective, to be able to, for instance, learn from failure, we have to cultivate it inside as well as just outside. And, and what, so for instance, I, I taught self-compassion day and become in at um, Dell Children's um, Medical Hospital, which is local in Austin. And they had me try to teach their, their healthcare workers who were so stressed and you know, overwhelmed self-compassion. Um, and which I did, and it really made a big difference for them being able to handle the stress of their jobs. But what they found pretty, pretty, pretty quickly is that the idea was spreading to other people who didn't take the actual training, that there actually became a culture of self-compassion in the hospital because people were living it, they were modeling it, not only verbally, they were doing that as well, but also in terms of the, how they carried themselves and, that, and people started impacting each other. So what we cultivate inside does impact what other people interact with. You know, what would we carry in our, our mind every single moment, every single person we come into contact with uh, and on a daily basis is impacted by our internal mindset. And that's why it's so key to pay attention to what we cultivate internally. So Paxton, you got it right. <laughs> right on. <laughs> got the gold Hold star. Thank you. <laughs> Hold it. Can I? And you too, Ethan. I mean, you too, all of you. I'm just saying, it's just, we, can't, we can't overlook that as we think about culture. We need to think about what's happening inside of us as well. That's yeah. great. Uh, and, and yeah, and so gold star is for everyone. From, from yeah. the Let me, can I jump? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I just want to jump because I think, and everyone has touched on it, but, but you know, Kristen really crystallized it in that, you know, I grew up in this business my, my whole life. And I've known since I was a child, the feeling of losing. And it, it is pervasive when you get on that plane um, after the game, when you're in the locker room. And, and you know, so, so anyone who's interested in this industry, you know, it is something you really have to learn to deal with this, this internal experience of, of losing because you feel like you failed and being able to get back on the train by Monday morning in the football world, you know, and, and, and get over that. And, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm such a fan of, of Kristen's work and, you know, great friend of, of Paxton is, you know, it is, it is essential. And, and when it doesn't happen, you know, I've seen so many people really, you know, get into health problems, get into, all types of difficult problems because they say the job is stressful. It, it is a stressful industry, but, but our relationship with, with that piece is so critical and being able to, to have some of the perspective that, that we've just heard, I think is so critical for folks who are interested in this industry. Oh, that's really good, Jim, and I agree. Um, and yeah, and I love all those answers. And, and go ahead, Paxton. I did want to drop. I, I did want to drop one quick thing in there, and, and that was you. You had asked me. I realized that I didn't finish answering your question when you asked me about uh, differences between the entertainment world and the sports world. There's really not many, uh, and I, I've I've noticed a lot of people make transitions and going back and forth between the two on a regular basis. Between uh, and and then venues would be another piece that's kind of a part of that as well because. Uh, in many situations, like here in Washington, D.C., the, the Capital One Arena is owned by the uh, Leonsis family, and they own the Washington Wizards and the Washington Capitals. And um, they become, an, an, in their own right, a content company. 
uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of times uh, sports owners have multiple ownerships of different things. And so the venue is certainly a part of it. And um, with most sports, i.e. Uh, basketball, you've got 40 home games. Baseball, you've got the longest one, which is 81 home games. But hockey, it's 40 home games, 41 home games as well. And so uh, the transition between employees working in the entertainment space and in the sports space uh, it's a seamless transition oftentimes between the two. And then the, the core of it, though, is that they're content companies. So athletics, uh, professional sports, are, it's content. And it's live content that you want to allure people to be there in real time in person to kind of like see it. And if you missed it, you really missed out on something special. It's not quite the same as seeing the highlights for it. You want people to be there in person to witness it. So it's, it's um, entertainment companies and sports companies are all in the entertainment business and they now have become more mindful of being content companies. So I just wanted to throw that in there. No, that's, that's great. I really appreciate that. And that's something, you know, we talk about a lot with our student in sport man our students in sport management, um, you know, many of whom come to this because they grow up loving sports. But I think sometimes the frameworks with which you conceptualize the industry are really important, right? And that content word, uh, that's critical, right? And, and like you said, the idea of those employees transitioning from putting on home basketball games to putting on a concert or whatever, that's another thing we kind of think about a lot is, um, and I know Jim talks about this too when he talks to students, is you've got to be ready to do a lot of things, a lot of which aren't even in the job description. Um, 100% correct. <laughs> right, and then that's the challenge, but also kind of the fun and the thrill of it. Um, and to our folks in the audience, I've, I've got one more question for the group, and then we've got time for q and I've seen a couple come in. Anything else, just click that Q&A button, and I'm going to do my best to get to them. And if we don't get to them, I'm going to hand these folks down and ask them questions and get you the answers somehow. So um, we're talking culture, moving into ethics, uh, which, again, is another one of those things that is just seems so easy on the surface, yet we are surrounded with day in, day out failures on the ethical front from individuals and from organizations and, you know, kind of merging these ideas together, you know, how can, and this is really a question to, to everyone from experience or research or both, you know, how can organizations, how can workplaces uh, empower employees to act ethically, to do the right things? Um, how do we create the structures that get people to do right and not compromise, you know, mission critical ethics? And I'll just throw it out. I'll let anyone jump in on that. Well, I, I guess I, I will just kind of maybe attack one part of it. It is uh, right now you're seeing failures in, in companies who don't do that, who don't have the mindset of, of um, uh, ethics and certainly uh, diversity is front and center nowadays. Uh, diversity and gender are front and center. Uh, I, I think one of the appeals uh, recently that's been uh, honing in on business leaders. And one of the reasons that, that um, it's become um, much, much more important is because organ it's, it's, it's a factual from multiple research on, on multiple fronts is organizations that have a diverse cultural uh, leadership, um, leadership at the top and certainly along the way on the rank and file side that they have been outstripping organizations that have not done that. Uh, and the, many of them that have not done it are becoming kind of dustbins and uh, footnotes in history. Um, diversity is profitable, and uh, leaders had to kind of one get to the point of believing it, and then seeing other people, other organizations that have become more diverse in their in their ownership structure, uh, outpaced them financially. It's unfortunate that it came down to just in many situations the dollar, but that happens sometimes, and I think it, it's it's proving itself out. And then the other part of it is the downside of it, uh, uh, that if you're, if you're not uh, diverse and um, in many situations, uh, you don't have a mindset of culture, uh, compassion, culture, and change, uh, the negative side of it are things that we've been seeing with the uh, various disturbances that have been uh, crossing the country in a very, very uh, prevalent way of people who have a closed mindset and who stop learn learning, stop growing and who aren't compassionate in their leadership and the unfortunate results are splashing across our country on a daily basis, in particular over the last year. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Ethan, I, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Um, I'm wondering what, you know, does the research tell us anything about, you know, can we address ethics before it comes to that 
you know, profit dollars and cents bottom line that that Paxton mentioned. Um, are there ways to get companies to do the right thing before they realize they're going to put themselves out of business? It's a great question. And uh, to be perfectly frank, if you had the answer to that one, you'd be a very rich person because you could go off to every single organization and, and go out and sell that. Uh, I, I think for me, one of the most important things about this or aspects to it is, is something that's called the knowing doing gap. So most of us have at least some sort of intuition about the ethics of particular issues. And there's lots of different decision-making rules and schemes and lots of different courses on moral philosophy about what it is that you need to do in order to behave ethically. The problem is knowing that and actually putting it into action are two very different things because of stuff like incentives, pressure, speaking up to you know, people that are more powerful than you. There's consequences for behaving courageously. And so as a result, a lot of the knowing what needs to get done versus successfully executing a set of actions to pull that off, especially without getting killed in the process, is an incredible challenge. And so uh, to me, this kind of goes back to the heart of, of why I've, I've studied the concept of voice is because that is a behavior that you can see when people speak the truth about issues that need to get resolved. And so as I've kind of taught about this, it, um, I, I see it in, in kind of three different main buckets of, of factors. The first is individual. And, and that is, you know, developing a, a habit and sort of a muscle for courage. So acknowledging that it's going to be uncomfortable at some point in time to tell your boss the truth or tell a customer who is quite lucrative that you can't do X, Y, or Z, that's, that's hard. Second is that relationship between you and the other person. And I'll come back and draw upon Kristen's research a little bit as well. That notion of compassion to understand the other person's incentives and points of view is incredibly vital because so many of us want to walk into the room and sort of drop the mic on what is the right thing to do without thinking about what is incenting the other person to take action. And so that relationship is really important. And then lastly, from an organizational standpoint, what, what is the kind of psychology and that mindset of managers that would predispose them to enable their people to feel heard, the people that they are managing? And for most leaders, you have a, a bevy of things on your plate to address. And the last thing that you want to do is to look for the very next issue that you have to resolve, especially if it's tricky and ethical. So it takes a mindset to go into those conversations in order for it to be something that's, that's quite productive. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, Kristen, I, maybe that, that sets you up well. I mean, thoughts on developing these these muscles to bridge the the knowing and doing gap yes yeah I do um so my latest work actually my, my new book which comes out in June is called fierce self-compassion and I, I and that actually comes from Buddhism this idea of fierce compassion in the in the sense that part of compassion means standing up for injustice if you aren't fighting against injustice you aren't alleviating suffering you know both internally and externally but the way we fight against injustice or maybe, you know, whether it's racial injustice, gender injustice, or something like just unethical behavior, exploitation of workers, et cetera, it really has to, it has to come. We need compassion both for ourselves and other people in so many different ways. So if you're the victim of an injustice, you're the victim, if you're, if you're someone who's being treated unethically, you need self-compassion to hold the pain of that without being overwhelmed because it really hurts, you know, emotionally, physically, in all sorts of ways. You need to help yourself. And you also have to aim that outward in the sense you need to stand up and demand fair treatment as part of caring for yourself. We can't, we can't forget the people, I think as Ethan said, the people who are causing the injustice or the uh, lack of ethics. You know, and so just talking about racial injustice, for instance, I've had to really use a lot of self-compassion and kind of, again, coming to terms with my own whiteness and my own white privilege. The reason people don't can't have such a hard time looking at that is because of shame. So if you shame people who are doing something unethical, 
What happens when we feel shame? We shut down. We don't look. We become defensive. We become rigid. We don't go there, right? We blame other people if we can, or we just become numb. We don't. We just don't look. It's too painful. So we need to have self-compassion to be able to hold that pain of maybe I am part of the problem, you know, and really to do that. And then we, once we hold our own shame, then we can start to free these barriers to taking action. So in other words, <laughs> I'm reducing shame and increasing compassion, almost whatever direction you're coming at it from is really key, I think, to the ability to, to transform. And it's also just really key to remember that compassion doesn't mean acceptance. Sometimes it does. Sometimes a compassionate thing to do is, well, just accept what is. But often that doesn't help alleviate suffering. Often the compassionate thing to do is to take brave, courageous action to change things. But just like in the tradition of Martin Luther King, you know, the great social justice movements, we can't cut anyone out of the circle of humanity. We can't start demonizing those evil corporate people or, you know, those evil people on the other political party, or, you know, we can't make anyone inhuman in our quest for change, because if we do that, we're actually undermining the goal of justice and the alleviation of suffering. So it, it really, you know, that's why this panel, I think, is so important. It really just comes down to this, this, this ethic of trying to prevent harm and to promote well-being for everyone, even the people we don't like, which is hard. It's really hard to do. But um, if we don't, the whole thing falls apart, in my opinion. Oh, thank you. That's great. Um, Jim, I think a lot to, to build on there and that line about, you know, even the people we don't like. Um, I know in the world of pro football, you got to deal with some of those. So thoughts on that or just other kind of perspectives on, you know, staying ethical in good times and bad. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say it's OK for, for the Ravens or the Browns or some of these other teams, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, no, what 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 everyone said previous to me is is so so powerful and beautiful to me i can't there's there's nothing i think i can say to to um to add but but you know i've had this amazing fortunate privileged you know blessed experience of this life that i've had because of my father and and the success of, of our family and the, and the business that we're in and and what occurred to me while everyone was speaking is that you know, whether they're the greatest athletes in the world, Joe Green and, and other players, uh, political leaders, you know, my father served under President Obama and Hillary Clinton, uh, the greatest business people that, that, you know, he was involved with throughout his life. None of the people that I saw who were extremely successful were focused on money. It, it wasn't that they didn't respect money, but their focus was executing their passion, the role that they were involved with as completely and as thoroughly as they possibly could. And so I've seen all of these people achieve this tremendous success and the, the, the path to that success, you know, provided a lot of money for a lot of them, but, but that was never the focus of, of any of the efforts that I saw them involved with. No, I really like that. Thanks, Jim. Um, all right, y'all, we're gonna look uh, at a couple of questions from our audience. And this one actually really ties in nicely to, uh, to Kristen's final point uh, there about working with, you know, with people we don't get along with. And so uh, this is a good one. So despite the earnest commitment to creating these cultures based on compassion, there can be problems between individuals with fundamental differences on hardened beliefs, especially in the US with increasingly polarizing political beliefs. For someone in a leadership role, what can be done to alleviate this and not have it derail the culture we're trying to build? Am I supposed to answer that one? <laughs> well, I think we already kind of got yours. Uh, but you Good, yeah, please, on it please someone, feel free. <laughs> please, how do we solve the problem of political polarization? Go for it. <laughs> That's another one of Ethan's billion dollar solutions that we're going to work on. Um, I mean, Kristen, I think we already got your answer here, so I don't know. Um, well, but maybe just to add in it as well, just we have to be humble in the sense that we can't control other people or control outcomes as well. It's just kind of that's just a reality. We have we can absolutely do our best. We must do our best, but we can't be attached to being able to have other people agree with us or see things from our point of view. Um, does it mean you can't fight them like hell? But <laughs> 
<laughs> and and I'll, I'll let someone else take that. Yeah, other thoughts on this? I think one thing to acknowledge is, uh, especially when you're in a leadership role and especially the, for larger organizations, um, to acknowledge that every one of us has a set of values and ideologies that we bring to the workplace. Um, and it absolutely shapes the way we think, the way we process information, the way we make sense of what's going on. And so it most certainly will impact not only core business decisions, and there's research evidence that suggests it impacts things like CSR, corporate social responsibility. It impacts uh, compensation and pay philosophy internally, impacts things like diversity initiatives internal to organizations. These ideologies shape the way you think, and as leaders, it shapes the decisions you make, and therefore it has a huge impact on the employees that you lead. So a lot of what we talk about is, is certainly in the leadership classes that we teach is one is to first acknowledge and understand the value systems that you bring into the workplace. Two is an understanding that that's not the only value system that's present. So if you make decisions that are wholly consistent with one value system, there's also research evidence to suggest that people who disagree with that value system are at a greater risk of turnover. And you play that out over time, you're going to create an organization that is much more homogenous. It's going to look and think and behave just like you as a leader. And that's not good for long-term effectiveness, decision-making, and ultimately performance. So as a leader, you not only have to understand your beliefs, but understand that there is a diverse uh, set of perspectives inside your firm. And therefore, the challenge becomes not just to make a decision, but to make it in a way that brings multiple stakeholders along with you um, and creates that sense of buy-in. And if you don't have that, as I said, there's a greater risk you're going to lose out on at least half of your employee base, if not a, 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 to a greater extent. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause there. No, I know. I like that. Um, Jim or Paxton, uh, building on this. Bridging gaps between very different worldviews. Jim, you want to jump in? <laughs> I mean, those answers were pretty amazing. I'm not sure. Uh, Jim said something a little bit earlier, but I'm not sure what to add on to it. But I, I guess I, I literally just say that I concur with the answers. I thought they were pretty amazing answers. And uh, I, I come back to open mindedness that, it, as I mentioned earlier, is, is like one of the core pieces. I think we've, I think in our own way that we've all shared, uh, I guess, positive things for uh, what could happen if you do them. And I think history is full of, uh, full of examples of, of less than positive uh, examples of people who don't do it and how their organizations candidly uh, don't make the, don't make the lift. And um, uh, negativity, just like positivity opens a lot of doors for you, negativity closes a lot of doors for you ultimately. And I think it makes you less than less than human somewhere along the way. And your conduct shows it. So that would be my small addition to what I think were great answers. That's a, that's a good addition. Uh, Jim, I, I can pivot to the next one for you unless you want to jump in on that one. We've got well, some responses there. Well, I, I got to show some guts since everyone else answered this question. <laughs> Um, I, I, I was hoping Kristen would just wrap it up. We moved, but, but, you know, so at the risk of, of, you know, there's two social scientists on the, on the thing here that clearly know more than me, but I, I read a book that, that really helped me with, with a couple pieces of the perspective, a uh, political, uh, well, he's a political commentator, but, but I think you could consider him political scientist. Ezra Klein wrote a book, Why We're Polarized. And in the book, he talks about the fact that, that almost you know, way back in our species, we started to factionalize to survive. And so that, that, that I just thought it was interesting that, that that is something I think we need to recognize to some degree. It doesn't mean we have to accept it. You know, I think as, as an adult and as, you know, as we evolve, we don't have to accept, but that that is that's sort of an, an intuitive place that we go to. And I think from there, I, I, I go to some of the people that I've seen deal with these well, you know, I spent a lot of time in, in Northern Ireland and, um, 
you had this this conflict that was a was a a warring conflict that that I never thought could could get solved, and unfortunately today we're seeing some 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 new versions of of you know we, we've had twenty years of peace in Northern Ireland, and I think what what people did well and and where I would say we need to deal with it in in ways here is you know you can't accept people that don't want to deal with fact you know that, that that's you don't accept that that someone's not not accepting factual information yet there is this level of of being willing to have compassion being willing to hear their point of view their perspective and 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 so so you know i think we have to have a layered approach um you know that that's mature that 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 it, that works on both of those you know i'm not going to accept someone that 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 doesn't accept facts i'm not going to accept their argument but uh you know I, I think Kristen was saying it that doesn't mean i dehumanize them off the bat because of that fact mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really that's really well said um all right a question from uh devin Oliveira. hope i'm saying that right and uh, paxton i think this is this is really for you but maybe others have thoughts as well and they ask, uh, they want to know about the concept of mentorship and the role it might play in passing down these ideas of ethics and culture and how those of us looking to be mentored uh, could best seek out that guidance and perspective. Uh, so uh, mentorship has been uh, overwhelmingly important to me throughout the whole of my life. Um, I was the product of a, a divorced family early on uh, my parents divorced when I was around six years old. And uh, so I always kind of developed a pattern of having big brothers and father figures in my life. And I've had uh, a multitude of them uh, over time who have been um, extremely important to me as a person. Uh, my, my greatest mentor is uh, Harry Belafonte, who is now uh, 94 years old. And I've learned uh, so much from him uh, over the course of the last 30 years that we've had a friendship. Uh, I've had another a number of other father figures and kind of big big brother figures. Uh, I think that uh, in answering on how do you get to those, one uh, is uh, having a pleasing personality. Like I think it's important to be kind of like a warm person, a likable person. I think a likable personality goes so very far. And then two, uh, it's I think it's incumbent upon you yourself to be an interesting person yourself and being able to carry a conversation. Uh, being able to ask good questions, being able to uh, have good insight. Uh, I've learned so much by asking a wide array of questions uh, from a load of different people uh, throughout the whole of the world. And I've been fortunate enough, uh, I started producing concerts in college uh, at Temple University. And prior to that in, in community college in Pittsburgh, um, when I first started kind of uh, writing for the student newspaper, and I've been a voracious reader the whole of my life. and with all of the friendships from professors to teachers, to pastors, to uh, mentors, uh, I've been able to contribute my own story, uh, regardless of what age I was when I was in my teens to uh, when I was in my 20s to my 30s and 40s and 50s. And I still, even uh, now at 60 years old, have mentors in my life and people who I learn from on a regular basis. So I think that uh, having an open mind yourself, uh, I think that you should, uh, each person should in their own way become interesting. And it's not that hard. <laughs> I think like reading is such a critical linchpin uh, for me on it. And uh, reading now from just having a phone where you can read pretty much everything. And uh, I read a stat uh, last week that uh, every six questions that Google was asked, it doesn't know the answer to, but it can give you, it can begin to give you some statistics to kind of get you toward what it is you're, you're trying to answer or have answered. So uh, with your phone and the power of everything that's on your phone, I, I often joke, a lot of young people don't remember Encyclopedia Britannica. And when we were young, uh, for those families that were financially challenged, you buy these books and you get like A, B. And then when you got to the later letters, there was about three or four letters kind of coupled together into one. And you might have uh, some of them because you bought them kind of on a layaway process. And uh, many families didn't have all the letters <laughs> under the Encyclopedia Britannica, whereas on your phone, that's a joke now because you, all those things that it would take to put in compendiums and volumes of information you can get just on your phone. So I think it's a, a, incumbent upon you to read, uh, 
to uh, be as knowledgeable as you possibly can. But I run across a lot of people who ask questions. And when they're in the process of asking questions, they're only answer, asking the questions to jump in with an answer. And so you have an opportunity to be around people who are masters and very learned. And you've talked the whole way versus listening to other people. So I think the art of listening is something that's very, very important. And um, having those questions kind of formulate in your brain to be able to ask people. And then uh, by way of being a good friend and being a compassionate person yourself, I love the theme of this with compassion, uh, being a compassionate person yourself. You don't always have to tell people uh, things that you can actually show them through your conduct and show them through your, through your just your being. And I think there's so much that's nonverbal about people. I think we're in tuned enough beings where we can feel that sincerity from other people. So being a sincere person, being a compassionate person, listening, being open-minded and taking advantage of the opportunities that you have. I think that mentors uh, in turn love to share and give you the energy from the things that you've learned. I certainly have found that to be the case uh, the whole of my life. And I, I've been blessed to literally without exaggeration travel the whole of the world from South Africa to North Africa to India through Asia, China, uh, uh, all throughout Europe, South America, et cetera. And I found that to be the case, even, even when people couldn't speak the same language that you speak, uh, you still have the opportunity to learn from them and um, the translator will appear. I love that. Uh, I was gonna ask the others about mentorship, but we're not following that answer up. I think that's, that's a rock solid way to bring this home. I will say this to the students out there. I mean, something that I myself had to learn and really work on improving is you can't get what you don't ask for. And there are people out there who want to share their experiences with you, who want to be your mentor. And it took me a long time to develop just some of that courage because it's easy to talk yourself out of it. Well, why would they, why do they don't want to talk to me? Um, and in this day and age, right, that, that same phone that has the whole of Encyclopedia Britannica and then some, it also has ways to get in touch with people. And you may not get an answer right away, or some people may never respond. Um, but we're living in an era where you can reach out. And, and I think if you bring some of that curiosity, some of that desire to listen that Paxson was talking about, you might be surprised at, you know, just how receptive people are to help guide you on your journey. I mean, this whole thing that we're bringing to an end in the next few minutes here uh, began with just one email that started with Jim and I said, hey, I'd like to work with this person. And so here we are. Um, and so to, to bring it home, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask just the kind of classic final question in something like this. We're a student-centered event, or if we're a student-centered event. We've got lots of folks kind of anxious, but also excited to get out in the world. Um, what's the best advice we've got What's the best advice you would have given yourself, you know, at, at a similar point when you were leaving college for the real world, so to speak? And um, I'm going to do it in the order I see y'all. So we'll start with Jim, Ethan, Kristen, Paxton. So Jim, go ahead. The best advice for the student entering the workforce. Um, so, you know, I, I hate this because it's trite, but it's just so true. You know, be yourself. I, I, I've I've talked about this. People love the word leadership. I, I think accountability is more important than leadership. Um, how we act, um, I, I think ultimately people will follow if we if we act the right way. Um, so so and and I know you may not know who yourself is right now, and that that so that may create some anxiety, and that's okay too. It's okay to to not know who you are. Be curious about discovering that and, and, you know, lean into that. And, and I think that, you know, that will allow you to, to, you know, find your way to, to all the other measurements that we put outside of ourselves to, to achieve success, but, but, you know, be yourself and, and, um, and follow what you love. Thanks, Jim. Ethan, best advice. Well, um, that actually mirrors uh, something that I was going to say as well, that is kind of a hallmark of, the courses that I teach, especially those around leadership, it kind of boils down to three different areas. The first is, is self-insight. That's the know thyself principle. You have to have an understanding and a, and a comfort level with who you are. Um, the second is learning and growth. So just who you are right now is not who you're going to be. So decide where you want to be and work on it. And then third, have an orientation towards impact. Um, some point in time over the course of this life, you are gonna make an impact on another human being, a community, an organization, and having in mind what that is and what you're striving for now 
will incredibly increase your chances of ultimate success. Thank you. Kristen. Uh, well, my answer is going to be predictable. I'm kind of a one trick pony, you might say, but um, you know, the research shows that self-compassion is like the superpower we have in our pocket and we don't even know it, right? We have the ability to be kind, supportive, encouraging to ourselves. It helps motivate us. It helps us see ourselves clearly. It helps us learn from failure. It helps us be strong and resilient. It helps us to stand up, to speak up. You know, it's this incredibly useful psychological tool we have in our back pocket, but no one ever told us we're allowed to be compassionate to ourselves. We're all, we, we know we're supposed to be compassionate to others, but we don't even sometimes realize that we can use the same supportive, encouraging stance toward ourselves. So I would just say, whenever you're struggling, whenever you feel fearful, whenever you feel inadequate, or, or and you're just dealing with something like the pandemic, just know that you have this superpower in your back pocket. Um, and all you've got to do, very simple, I'll give you a very quick tip to know how to be self-compassionate. Just imagine you had a good friend you dearly cared about who was struggling with the exact same situation you're struggling with. What would you say to your friend to help them in that moment? And then try saying it to yourself. It's not rocket science, right? Uh, and it makes a huge impact um, in your well-being. I, I love that. Thank you. Or all right, Texas. So, tough finish, tough finish. There you go. <laughs> so, so let me let me say it's been wonderful being with with uh, everybody on the on the Zoom call tonight. Um, I, I've learned so much from my panelists, and I'm humbled to be the one the one uh, in the in the chair to finish. So, uh, I think that the things that you fill and imbue your mind with are the things that ultimately will be the things that come out. So, I can't uh, I can never overemphasize your your positive mental attitude. Uh, I've learned so much from the people that I've read, the people I've been around. Uh, I have multiple heroes in my life and she rose in my life, uh, starting with my mother. And uh, so I would, in, I would encourage everybody to fill your brain with positivity. Uh, I, my favorite book in the whole world is Think and Grow Rich. And I've read multiples of other people's books who've come off of that. But that to me is the granddaddy of what I call success books. Uh, the other thing I, I, I've like little affirmations, I can't say enough about those. I, I have them on stick and pads, a little three of stick and pads and everything else around me uh, in my desk in front of me. I've got pictures of things that motivate me. And, and so uh, fill your mind with things that motivate you. Uh, live the life that you imagine that you'd like to live. And I, I think um, th that goes a long way in being uh, authentic was one of the words that I heard a little bit earlier. Uh, the great Miles Davis, one of the greatest um, composers in, in history, uh, had a saying, he said, you, you have to play a long time before you sound like yourself. And um, in jazz music, you kind of, and the same thing with basketball, a lot of times in sports, you have heroes or people who, who you uh, pattern different parts of your life on. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that on the positive qualities and other people kind of like patterning some of those and kind of getting to the point of owning some of those. And then, um, and then authentically putting your own stamp on it. So I, I've done that multiple times. I've, I've uh, dared to uh, be able to go up to celebrities and different people and ask them a question and say something. I, I, like the bulk of the people who I listened to when I was younger in the, in the early 70s, I've developed friendships with uh, Stevie Wonder, um, Bernine White and Maurice White from Earth, Wind and Fire, Ron Isley, Dionne Warwick, uh, Ramsey Lewis. So why did we, like the people when I was younger, like in a million years when I was in my 11, 12, 13 years old, I never would have thought that I would have been able to have grown up and had relationships with people who I listened to their music on the radio or on records. And like, as I grew in time, I, I built those friendships. And uh, so to be bold enough to believe in yourself, to believe that you have something authentic that you can add to other people's lives and then kind of showing them through your, your living and your being. So dare to dream, uh, believe in your dreams. Uh, when I was a kid, um, I collected baseball cards and remember the capacities of different stadiums. And now it's like a lot of those people I have friendships with on the sports sides as well. So don't think that don't sell yourself short and, and not think that you can achieve a lot of the things that are out there for you to achieve. So dare to dream, dare to be bold. Those are not just words. Those are things that I've actually achieved in my life. And so I know they're achievable. And if other people can achieve those things, you too can achieve those things as well yourself. It's a beautiful experience and life can be as beautiful as you picture it and as beautiful as you choose to live it. 
Thank you. I mean, what a way to end, not just this panel, but an entire week of, of amazing conversations. Uh, thank you, seriously, from the bottom of my heart, Kristen, Ethan, Paxton, amazing. I'll say thanks to Jim as well, but Jim and I are gonna stick around for a couple minutes to wrap up the show. Folks, we know it's it's been a, a good session, a good good long conversation. We'll just say a few more announcements as we, as we bring it on home, but thanks again to the panelists. Thanks to everyone who stuck around and watched. And um, let me take them off their spotlights here. Cool. And I'm going to defer thank to you. my. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to defer to Jim here to, to get us started on the wind down uh, as we as we bring home the inaugural playing the long game. Well, I I think we should pin one other person though. I think we should bring Mikhail up here because she right. she deserves full recognition. Yes. For all that uh, she has done. So, Michaela, thank you. Oh. You have. You have made this uh, such a reality. We we had this idea, um, uh, Tolga and I, but but um, you know you just did so much work that people will never see. So thank you, first and foremost. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, and um, I'll be back to do it again. <laughs> Great. I want to quickly thank you know the folks from um, my team as well, Amber. Jill, Brittany, uh, some of the other folks, Stephanie, my wife, who was in here for, for uh, especially when I was the moderator, uh, trying to get me the questions. I don't think either of us solved the internet yet. So, so we didn't do quite as well with our Q&A as you did, but uh, Steph was, was a huge help. And our dog was in here as well. So <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, I wanna thank all of the panelists that, that we invited uh, from, from industry that, that I contacted, uh, just so grateful for your time and, and everyone volunteered. So thank you for that. It was a thrill, Tolga, to work with the, the brilliant minds of the University of Texas. Um, you know, I could, I could say something about each of them, but, but just such a, such a thrill there. I will make a special note about Commissioner Tagliabu, um, you know, getting him to, to give us basically a day of his time um, in Washington. Um, just just a, a wonderful man. And it, it's funny that, that so many of the things he said with the with wisdom of, of being you know, a past leader, so many folks followed up with and, and, and gave more detail, but, but he had that, that vision for us. Um, the technical folks at, at NBC Sports in Washington and Fred Gadelli from Sunday Night Football made that video possible. And Tolga, you and your family, thank you. I know that uh, your whole family um, had, had a lot to do with, with letting this become a reality. So, uh, it's just been a joy and a pleasure. So, and, and finally the students, everyone who logged in, you guys are great. And, and thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Jim. Um, and likewise, thank you. I mean, this is something we cooked up together after some conversations in class and in, in class visits from Jim. And we said, what can we do that's bigger? What kind of show can we put on? And of course, in our infinite wisdom, late last summer, we thought for sure we'd be doing this live. Um, but if you promise something, you got to hold yourself accountable. So I'm going to just put it on the record right now. We're doing this again next year. We're doing it live in Austin. And I hope that some of you who have joined us digitally will join us in person. Uh, and I'll also just thank everyone again who, who came, who attended, who registered, who shared, who promoted. Um, we promise not to spam you, but we are gonna use those emails. We're gonna send you a follow-up survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts. What can we improve on? What would you like to see in the future? Uh, and we won't send you too many, but we hope to stay in touch over the course of the year, not just to let you know about future versions, but to also share updates from our many wonderful panelists and other things that we, we think you'll find interesting. Um, we're committed to playing long, as we say. We wanna build a community around this idea, around meaningful conversations, and hopefully this is just the first of many. So again, thank you to Jim, to Michaela, to the UT folks, to the industry folks, to the panelists. Um, never in my wildest dreams, to Paxton's point, if you had told me you know, when we started this that I'd get the commissioner of the NFL, Paul Tagliabue, who I grew up watching, who was larger than life, if I'd have professional sports team owners having a conversation with me, I would have said, nah, that's not gonna happen. So. Um, you got to believe in it and you got to go for it. And I'm, and I'm really grateful to my team here for, uh, for joining me in that. So thanks again, everyone. We know it was a lot of content this week. And I know some of these names in the chat, you were there all week long with us. So 
We thank you um, and we'll see you again sooner than later. I think with that, good night. We'll give you a hook up too. Bye everyone. <laughs>